When you consider their incredible fuel economy, their legendary reliability, and their unmatched value, it's easy to see why San Diego has fallen in like with the new Hondas. Hi, I'm Mike Peterson. If you like friendly service, you'll like Tipton Honda, a dealer for the people. We're off Interstate 8 in El Cajon. This episode was made possible by Qualcomm. Qualcomm celebrates Southern California's most innovative thinkers. To learn more about the entrepreneurial ideas and bold imaginations that drive the future of digital communications, visit Qualcomm.com. Starting with just a business plan created in a college classroom, Chris Kramer and Matt Ratner were ready to take an idea to fruition. Carl Strauss was one of the first companies to create a microbrewery in today's hotbed of Southern California. Well, we started developing Carl Strauss Brewing Company uh, after I had seen the idea for craft brewing down in Australia and recognized that there was an opportunity for San Diego and Southern California to have its own great craft beer. Uh, so through the process of first Matt and his uh, business school classmates writing a first draft of a business plan, uh, which was a, a class project, and then ripping that class project apart and developing the more uh, fully blown idea for a business plan, um, we came up with our progression of how we thought we could grow a business over time and that was based on our idea that using Uncle Carl's unique brewing skills and taking the quality assurance programs from big breweries and putting it down to a craft brewery level that we could make consistently excellent beers at a level that craft brewers weren't doing here in the United States. After Chris got back from Australia we wrote a business plan you know, for for the business and what we had done is gone up to the Pacific Northwest and to the Bay Area where there were a few breweries and we saw what they were doing and we thought you know great this should work for Southern California and then we had Carl who you know we thought with Carl on board we could always uh, you know in business parlance we'd say sustainable competitive advantage we just thought we could make better beer and uh, and, and then really it was, it was just trying to fit it to what we thought would work in Southern California. And so we went and in 1988 we raised about half a million dollars uh, and so we thought at that point in time here are two young kids with a business plan and a world famous master brewer Carl Strauss um, that seemed like all the money in the world. Um, a year later when we finally got the first brewery open downtown we'd spent more than a million dollars. On February 2nd, 1989, the first Carl Strauss Brewery was opened, but Matt and Chris knew they needed an edge, so they decided to intertwine a restaurant into their brewery, giving them the ability to not only serve beer, but food to go with it. We thought it was just too risky to start up a brewery that was a standalone by itself. So in order to start the first new brewery in the city of San Diego in more than 50 years, uh, we thought we needed to have an angle which was also have a restaurant incorporated with the brewery so that we could have a venue where people could come in, we could teach them about what made Uncle Carl's beer so special and uh, then have them taste the beers, enjoy them in an appropriate environment, create a brand uh, recognition and uh, preference for our Carl Strauss beers. From day one, our expectations were that we were going to build uh, a great brewing company in Southern California for Southern California, and I think that we've managed to do that. People lined up around the block to get into our brewery downtown, and we were on every TV station, we were on every radio station, we were at every print media, and the publicity was absolutely amazing, um, but it also meant that we were doing so much more volume than we ever planned for. And on the beer side of our business, we started running out of beer. 
within the first week we realized that we had to go out and increase our brewery plant capacity down at the original brewery to maximize it out. It was the only time in our company history where we had to bring in outside beer just to keep serving people. And then on the restaurant side of the business, we were doing 100% more volume than we ever planned for the kitchen to do, which created its own problems. The uh, brewery restaurants do very well. We process over a million people a year that come through our doors. Uh, it's, I think they, we've pioneered the beer culinary connection, sort of the, you know, maybe gastro pub with beer concept. We've been doing it a long time because we're a firm believer that, uh, you know, beer is a terrific, um, you know, uh, accompaniment to a bunch of different foods. And it's really just educating the consumer about that. With their business being in a relatively new sector, Carl Strauss came across some difficulties in the early years. This put them in the position to get creative and think outside the box. First, we had trouble just finding a brewer. Because back, back then, there, it wasn't really, a, unless you went to work for the big breweries, there was no such thing as a micro brewer, someone who was going to work for a small brewery. So we actually hired a guy who had been trained as a winemaker uh, out of the UC Davis. Almost no one who came in to our original brewery downtown had ever tried a craft beer before. And we, when we first opened, only had three different types of beer. Uh, and we had our Carl Strauss Amber Lager, our uh, Gas Lamp Gold, and our Downtown After Dark. People would come in and they would try these three beers and almost universally they would use the exact same words. They'd say, this is the best beer I've ever tasted. And they said it over and over and over again. So when Uncle Carl would go on the radio, he would say, you'll agree, it's the best beer you've ever tasted, or my name isn't Carl Strauss. And uh, that became part of the, the culture of our company when we first, first started. Really the best thing we can do is put our beer into uh, consumers' mouths. And so the brewery restaurants process over a million people a year coming through our doors and our whole goal there is to turn people on to beer and you know in different styles of beer and we brew a huge variety we don't expect everyone to like every single beer however we think there will always be a style that that someone's going to really like one of the things people forget is that when we first opened 22 years ago people would come in they would see Carl Strauss Amber Lager which is a mild Bavarian you know session beer and they would say oh that beer's too dark I couldn't possibly drink that beer you know nowadays you have people drinking you know strong Belgian ales and double IPAs and thinking nothing of it but we had to develop the market so nowadays in our seven breweries here in Southern California we make more than 80 different beers every year. We do a different cask beer every week in our, our brewery restaurants. Yeah, our top three beers that we sell are Red Trolley, Carl Strauss Amber Lager, and Tower 10 IPA. And uh, the best of all, the, the top seller of all that's our Red Trolley. And I think it's just a, a terrific beer, differentiated and very unique for the marketplace. Uh, we have a fantastic team of brewers led by Paul Segura, our brewmaster, and uh, we have uh, wonderful, passionate team members throughout the company who see ideas or see flavors, and then they come back and we talk about them, and we end up incorporating these styles uh, into our, our Carl Strauss lineup of, of beers. The uh, actual making of the beer takes between six to eight hours. After we finish that process, Process, the beer is then moved to a fermenter tank and that's where the beer is going to sit for two to three weeks we're going to add yeast and that's going to create alcohol you know all of our brewing starts with grain you know barley malt then we use water hops and yeast uh, we primarily brew here at Carl Strauss Brewing Company according to the Reinheitsgebot, the Bavarian purity laws of 1516, but we also, as a craft brewer, are able to embrace other ingredients that we can use in our brewing. It's a, it's a very, very old process, you know, goes back to Egyptian times, and, and really it's an easy process. What's tough is to make consistently good beer time after time. And so that's where we really 
focus our attention because where wine can vary from year to year, you know, you have a great varietal one year and next year it's not as good, everyone expects a beer to be absolutely consistent year in, year out, and yet, uh, you know, the raw materials vary year to year just like in any other uh, agricultural, agricultural product. We actually test every single tank of beer, every batch of beer, every single time across all seven of our breweries. We have built one of the most sophisticated laboratories of any craft brewery in the country and we've employed these uh, quality assurance uh, programs to make sure that the beer is up to ours and Uncle Carl's exacting standards. Today, Carl Strauss is at the forefront of a growing industry. They've set many precedents which new companies have followed. Through their multiple restaurants and growing distribution, they look to keep the business thriving well into the future. Currently, we're undergoing our next uh, ex you know, expansion of capacity. We just ordered a quarter of a million dollar kegging line. We've ordered new tanks. And for the first time in our company's history, we are working to make this into a tourable facility and open up our distributing brewery here in Pacific Beach to the public. We're on track this year to do close to 45,000 barrels, or uh, another way to look at it is that's about 7 million glasses of beer. Well, we have grown to become the 44th largest craft brewer in the entire United States out of more than 1,700 craft brewers, and we have one of the smallest distribution areas just here in Southern California. Our distribution today is about 3,500 different outlets, retail outlets throughout Southern California. We're the official microbrew beer of Disney's California Adventure. We're in uh, all of the major airports, uh, multiple kiosks. Uh, we're now in SeaWorld, which is awesome. So we have uh, just you know pretty wide distribution. However, we're still only in Southern California. I think as we continue to move forward, as our team grows, as the influence that we have in the industry and in our region continues to expand, um, we become even more passionate uh, about what we're doing and people respond to that passion. They, they love our beers, they love Carl Strauss and what we stand for. They know that we're going to take care of people. They know we're going to do things right. They know that uh, we're the sort of people that they want to do business with and that they even want to have as part of their lives. I think our plans for Carl Strauss right now and even in the future is simply to continue to focus on quality beer production, continue to grow as the market grows, to continue to turn people on to fresh beer and make people happy one Carl Strauss beer at a time. I think in the next five, ten years, Carl Strauss Brewing Company is going to continue doing exactly what we have been doing that's made us so successful for the last 22 years. Uh, our vision is to continue to grow uh, our uh, distributed beer business, to share more Carl Strauss beer with more people and create more happiness that way. I believe that ultimately we'll be uh, uh, creating new brewery restaurants and new geographical markets uh, to expose uh, people to our Carl Strauss brand and teach them uh, as we, we grow out from San Diego. Coming up, Scott Lutwack shows off an array of businesses he built from the ground up. In a society that has made health and fitness a priority, Scott Lutwack is ready to cater to the people who are looking for something a bit more exquisite. Creating Fit, a state-of-the-art facility that has brought the consumer to expect nothing less than the best. Uh, currently, Fit has two locations. Our location in uh, Houston is 30,000 square feet and we have just under 5,000 members. And uh, the location here in San Diego is 46,000 square feet, and we have just under 5,000 members also. In the gym business or in any other business, I think you, know, you, you, need, to set, you need to figure out how you're gonna set yourself apart from the, the competing businesses. And for us, one of the things that we've always been emphatic about is that we would have the best equipment available in the world. And I go to all of the fitness shows um, all around the world and I try to find the best possible equipment and bring it here to this gym. We change out, our, we change out the equipment every couple years just to make sure that, we're, that we really stay on, on, uh, on top of the equipment selection. The first time people see fit, 
it's hard for them to ever really go back to the, the current gym that they have, you know. And, 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 and once they speak to a fit member and they hear about the experiences that, uh, that they have here and how much the average fit member enjoys their, their membership here, it really incentivizes them to, to join relatively quick. I, I think for any business to be successful, they need to be well networked in their community. It's very important to understand who is surrounding you, what businesses and what they're doing. And East Village here is a developing area. We came to East Village because we knew that there were big plans here. And when we found out about Thomas Jefferson and what their plans were, we, we contacted them prior to any construction or, or most people even really knowing that they were coming here. And we started the process very, very early on. Um, and that's really, that really helped. The gym has a general manager. His name is Chad Shaw. Um, Chad is responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the gym in terms of managing the staff and the day-to-day -day expenses of the gym. Um, the way I like to set up the operation is that everybody in the gym answers to Chad and then Chad and I work together to solve all the, all, all of the, all the problems of the gym. I've been in the fitness industry for about six years now. Um, I was a, started off as a personal trainer. Um, I have my bachelor's degree in kinesiology from San Diego State University. Also had three national certifications. Um, I then worked for 24 Hour Fitness as a trainer for about a year. And then I was a fitness manager for two years. And then I was a club manager, which is a general manager for about a year and a half. The key to keeping fit a success and making the members happy is, is change. Um, you know, nobody likes to be stagnant. Everybody always has a different goal at all times. So, you know, we do things like we have pool parties out here at FIT for the members where, you know, we will provide the food and the music and everything. Um, you know, we always, we're getting new equipment every single year so that the members can always have something new. Uh, we, we even move the gym around, add new classes all the time. So, I mean, really the members, they, you know, they want change. They don't want to be stagnant. They want a gym that's evolving with their goals as well. At FIT, we have state-of-the-art classes. Um, we have our cross training center where we have Jiu Jitsu, who our instructor for Jiu Jitsu is Leticia. Um, she actually is a six time uh, consecutive women's world champion in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, so the best in the world. So we have Jiu Jitsu, we have kickboxing, we have boxing, um, we have uh, CrossFit style classes as well. Um, we have kettlebell classes, and then of course spin and yoga. Um, I mean, any, pretty much any group exercise class you can possibly think of, boot camp, everything. Scott Lutwack's uncanny ability to capitalize on an opportunity when it presents itself has led him to create Brooklyn Bagel and Bialy, a contemporary bagel shop down the street from Fit Gym. In a short time, it has become a popular spot to grab a bite on the go. Brooklyn Bagel was created about one year ago, and, uh, it was a great opportunity to combine uh, a passion with an opportunity. Um, here in San Diego, we found, surprisingly enough, that there were no good bagels being made available anywhere in the downtown area. Uh, that was the opportunity, and uh, the passion is to create good food in an area where it's not readily available, and we found that right here in East Village. Um, the opportunity was available, and we took it. I am the operator of the restaurant. I am responsible for virtually every aspect of ordering that sunflower seed all the way to what that finished product tastes like. So as the operator, all the recipes are mine, the inventions, the articulation of how everything is put together from how we orchestrate the menu is all mine. Um, my background, I'm Italian by nature. Uh, I've also been trained culinarily. I've been executive chefs in high-powered restaurants. And so all the recipes that you see have been made specifically to go ahead and be prefaced either on this canvas of a bagel or the canvas of a bialy. And a bialy, unlike a bagel, is not made every other day. It's made fresh every day and then just like a leavened bread product. So my responsibility is to go ahead and make sure that this bread product as a palette really goes ahead and showcases whatever items I put on it. Um, and I've done that in different ways from a vegetarian aspect to a meat aspect to um, turkeys, cheeses, and stuff. And so I really am a painter, essentially. I use our bread product each day to go ahead and, and, and make this portrait of what each dish is supposed to represent. 
to start out with a product that's got yeast. It's a leavening agent that allows it to grow. And what we do is we introduce that with water, flour, and different agents to go ahead and make that bloom. And so what we'll do is every day, we're gonna go ahead and make a batch of dough. It might be a plain dough, it might be a cinnamon raisin bagel dough, it might be a sun-dried tomato, any one of the different doughs. And we make that in a day in advance, and then once we add that leavening agent, which is the yeast, at 110 degrees, it starts to bloom or grow. And then it has to temper. So after about 45 to an hour and a half, at room temperature, that yeast has reached its maximum occupancy and then is ready to be retarded. We'll then take the dough, and after that time, we're gonna go ahead and put it in the refrigerator, and that refrigerator makes that leavening agent stop. So it basically is a catalyst that now has been halted. 24 hours later, after that dough has gone ahead and rested and retarded, we're gonna go ahead and reactivate that catalyst by introducing it to water and to heat. So the bagels, which are made fresh every day, the day before, then get put into a boiling bath of water, and they're boiled between four to six minutes, depending upon the bagel. And then they're baked in an oven at 550 degrees. So imagine we have this live product at 110 degrees, it's been retarded, and all of a sudden it's been asked to go ahead and bloom again. Heat is the catalyst, water is one of the things. For yeast to grow, it needs oxygen, water, sugar, and air. And so that is what's happening. And then we put it in our oven for 550 degrees, and that goes for about 12 to 14 minutes. And once that happens, that thing puffs up, gives that traditional bagel shape that you see. And then after that process happens, we pull it out and we put it in there fresh uh, every day. Without preservatives, any bread product can never be microwaved. It can only be good for three to five hours. So we cook our bagels three to four times a day to make sure that that fresh product uh, is available throughout the day. The, the key to keeping this business and I think any business successful is, is listening to your customers. You know, every day our customers will walk in the door and they'll, they'll tell us what they like and what they don't like. And we're actually listening, you know, with, with great intent to everything that they say. And we, we make those changes. Um, we listen, we listen, and, and we try to make the changes that uh, will make them happy. There's no slowing down Scott Lutwack. Even with his hands full running a gym and a bagel shop, his entrepreneurial background will not let him rest. He's currently looking to strike gold for a third time, working on his newest venture titled Food At, a healthy food service for people who want to save time and eat good. Food At is built as a private label nutrition program. It's the first of its kind, and we've launched at Fit is the first location that we've launched it. So we have Food At Fit as the first test market. Um, here you see some of, of some of that food right here. The, the way the, the nutrition program works is, is as follows. Anytime somebody joins the gym, immediately they're introduced to the nutrition program as being as important to their health as the workout itself. So now we have uh, hundreds of people at the gym right now that, are, that order their food online uh, on Mondays, and then their food is picked up two times per week on Mondays and Thursdays. You pick up your food on Monday for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and you pick up your food on Thursday for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So far, the feedback has been exactly what we've expected. Uh, the clients are, are achieving their goals, number one, and also the time that they're saving by not having to prepare these meals themselves has been as much of a benefit to them as the weight loss itself. We're expecting to grow this business five times, as, as large as it is right now. Right now, we're producing about 5,000 meals a month. We're expecting to do about 25,000 meals per month within the next year. My work ethic stays the same. I, I like to work hard and I like to work long, but as you, I like to work smarter. And the key to keeping it all in line is finding great people. Um, every one of the organizations that I'm involved with has great people working there every single day, and without the people on the team, nothing happens. The greatest benefit of owning your own business is the, the flexibility to be able to fulfill your, your dreams, to have a vision of building something and having the ability to execute on it. The plan for FIT and my other ventures is growth. Um, as the models prove themselves out um, during these uh, financially challenging times, I think that the opportunity is going to present themselves for growth in each one of the businesses that, uh, that I'm involved with right now. For updates and prizes, follow us on Twitter at WTB Show.
This episode was made possible by Qualcomm. Qualcomm celebrates Southern California's most innovative thinkers. To learn more about the entrepreneurial ideas and bold imaginations that drive the future of digital communications, visit Qualcomm.com.